I'm Sarah. I'm Cindy. And I'm Simmer. And we're the Florida Gravity Team. Our goal is to fabricate a, and optimize a user-friendly and easily addressable gravity-powered fluoride removal system for future field testing and eventually implementation. So the majority of all Clara plants are located in Central America, where the source of drinking water comes from surface water. And all Clara's mission is to prevent, provide safe drinking water for all. So we expanded our goals and we noticed that there are moderate to high levels of fluoride pollution in regions such as India, East African Rift Valley, North Africa, and Ghana, where their drinking water comes from groundwater sources and fluoride comes from the weathering rocks. There, in areas of little to no fluoride in, uh, in water, we notice that we add water to, uh, we add fluoride to, we add fluoride to prevent teeth decay and in high concentrations there are, there are detrimental effects. Therefore, we, there is a recommended limit of 1.5 milligrams per liter of water in if of fluoride in water by the wa World Health Organization and in greater than 1.5 milligrams per liter th there's detrimental effects such as skeletal fluorosis which prevent which causes the deformation of bones as well as dental fl fluorosis and this is a serious health concern as we try to as more than 65 million Indians consume more than 1.5 milligrams per liter of fluoride contaminated water every day. So, as far as the team objectives are concerned, these fall under four major areas. First, to improve the efficacy of fluoride removal. Second, by making this apparatus more self-sufficient. Third, by making it more cost-effective and easy to operate. And finally, field testing the apparatus to make sure that it's effective in real-world scenarios. So to understand the methodology of our entire system, what we start off with is introducing fluoride contaminated water. In this case, we model it using red dye. We then introduce PAC, which is a coagulant, into a flocculator, which then flocculates and creates aluminum hydroxide precipitates in the form of these flocks, which then separates that from the fluoride-free water. So as far as our previous research is concerned, in the spring of 2018, the spring 2018 fluoride team focused on implementing float valves in tanks, as well as to include sliders to change heights to easily adjust the volumetric flow rates within the system. Then, in the summer of 2018, teams continued to conduct tests on varying pack concentrations and fitting the data that they obtained into a Langmuir adsorption spectrum. Then finally, in the fall of 2018, we saw the team develop an IV drip chamber system to monitor the coagulant flow rate effectively within the system. So, what exactly did we do? Our apparatus had a few modifications. We started off by developing a T-junction that introduced PAC through microtubing at the top of a translucent tube, which allowed us to monitor the rate at which PAC was being introduced, while also allowing it to mix with the red dye itself. However, what we realized is while it worked the first time, the flocculation wasn't happening afterwards. So we decided to take that T-junction and turn it vertically. Here, as you can see, is the pack introduction through a microtubing at the top of this T-junction where another side is actually introducing the red dye in the system and then out comes the red dye plus the pack. What we then notice is that the two solutions were mixing rather effectively, allowing for flocculation to continue to occur. Now when we looked at flocculation, we found that there were several complexities, and one of this was system velocity. Um, so we found that at very low system velocities, there was no flocculation, or very little flocculation, as seen in the diagram on the left. Um, and we can see that at these very low velocities, the, the flocks are not able to collide with each other as well. Um, and this allows, or this disallows the flocks from creating um, large flocks in the flocculator. Um, but on the right hand side, we can see that there are large flocks, and this was obtained at a system velocity of 0.48 milliliters per second. Um, and we found that at this velocity, the flocks were able to collide with each other, but the residence time was long enough so that there was enough time for the flocks to actually form. But more important, we found that flocculation is also highly dependent on dosing. Um, so when we found that we had excess pack, uh, we found that there was absolutely no flocculation regardless of system velocity. 
Whereas when we decrease the flow rate of pack in the system, um, and we did this by decreasing the thickness of the microvore tubing, um, which would increase frictional head loss, um, we found that this allowed for flocculation to occur at a variety of effluent flow rates. And so this elucidates that um, flocculation is actually more dependent on dosing than it is on system velocity. Um, and so we were able to empirically determine the system concentration of PAC in the system by modeling its flow rate with the height um, in the system. And we found that this created a linear regression which allows us to map the height at any given point with the flow rate. Um, and this is important in determining the concentration of PAC in the system at any given time. Um, we also did the same with system velocity and we found this by mapping the effluent flow rate. Um, and so we found the height under the height of zero flow um, and we also created a linear regression from this. And so we found that at a variety of heights there were a variety of different effluent flow rates as well. We noticed that there, there was accumulation of red, red dye flocks at the bottom of the sedimentation tank, which causes a formation of a gel. Therefore, we added a new bottom geometry, as shown on the right side, where we increased the recirculation of flocks, and it allowed the clean water to exit the effluent line and the red dye flocks to exit the waistline. We also noticed that from the there's a floating flux in the sedimentation tube where the red flux are supposed to be heavier than water, but then it was floating and we noticed that we were using pressurized water where the air bubbles in the water were combining with the red dye flux and floating up the effluent line. Therefore, we are, using, we are now using degassed water where there are no more air bubbles in the water and it solved their problem. Okay, so we found that there are several challenges in the system still that remain. Um, and one of these is consistent flocculation. Um, and this is highly related to dosing. So we found that at, a, at different days, <coughs> the system would behave differently, um, most likely depending on the different dosing of red dye or pack that we had each day. And so uh, by figuring out the relationship between pack and red dye binding, we can better create more consistent flocculation. Um, there's our issue of air bubbles, and we found that air bubbles would decrease the flow rate through the system as well as causing backflow in some instances. And so a mechanism to reduce the number of air bubbles introduced into the system um, would be greatly beneficial. And lastly, the greatest challenge is scaling to fluoride. Um, and so the worry is that at very low concentrations, um, PAC will not sufficiently be able to bind to um, fluoride or red dye in this case. And so more testing should be done to further investigate this. So in terms of our future tasks for our project, essentially we need to first determine the dosage for optimal PAC binding. Second, we need to find the conditions for consistent flocculation, as that's going to be key for our system to be able to operate for a long periods of time within regions that need it. And then testing the system using fluoride will be critical to understand whether our system actually works in the real world where it needs to remove literal fluoride. And then finally, we'll be creating an odd shape model to ensure that this system can be fabricated in other regions as well, outside of, of course, Cornell, and to ensure that the system can have access to other regions as well. So in conclusion, what exactly can you take away from fluoride gravity? Essentially, when fluoride contaminated water is introduced into our system with PAC, we can essentially properly mix this, these two solutions together in a T-junction, flocculate them at the right dosage and velocity, and then introduce them into a sedimentation tank thanks to a bot geo, ensuring the formation of a fluidized bed, which can then result in two things, an aluminum hydroxide precipitate in the form of flocks and fluoride-free water. Thanks.